All right. So, thank you everyone for coming to today's Binalo Talks. I see that we have a lot of new faces here. Um, for those who are new to the Binalot, um, this started in 2003 as a way to regularize our Wednesday meetings where we talk about our research interests and we invite people from various backgrounds to talk about their research. So for today, um, quick announcement. Uh, we have a yoga session at 5.15 p.m. in this room, so please join us if you'd like. And we also have some Zuo Arc shirts and merch available. Please approach me for those. Okay, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. Mr. Vincent Christopher A. Santiago, or Vinci, is currently an instructor at the UP Department of Linguistics. His research interests include language documentation and description acoustic phonetics, and dialectology. He has presented his research in the Southeast Asian Linguistic Society Conference, the Philippine Linguistic Congress, and various other conferences and colloquia. He is also a member of the Linguistic Society of the Philippines. So, everyone, a round of applause for Mr. Vinci. Hello, uh, thank you so much for taking the time off your lunch time to uh, come here and listen and uh, engage with the topic. So I have a print out of six pages single spaced. So I will do my best <laughs> to be able to raratratin ko ng 30 minutes. Tasana dun sa next 30 minutes or less ay makapag usap usap tayo. So the title of my talk is What Can Historical Linguists Learn from Archaeologists? Some Reflections from Teaching Ling 150. Naririnig ba ako sa likod? Naririnig man? Okay, thank you. So, Ling 150, then and now. As a linguistics undergrad in 2013, I considered Linguistics 150 ang familia ng mga wikang Austronesia, my favorite course, to be quite honest. There was just something about seeing how everything was all connected that excited me and piqued my interest. The discussions of the micro, individual speech sounds and whether they were pronounced at the soft palate or the pharynx, to the, uh, to the macro, I should say, how a food-producing, seafaring, and head-hunting people spread the family of languages now spoken from Madagascar in the west, Aotearoa or New Zealand in the south, to Rapa Nui or Easter Island to the east. So I was very fascinated by that um, interaction of the micro going up to the macro. The presentation of this range of topics was all thanks to my teacher in that course, Tuting Hernandez, uh, Jesus Federico Hernandez. He had already taken it as an undergrad himself, but when it was his turn to teach it, he was the one who populated the syllabus with uh, most of the current authors and mainstays of our syllabus, Bob Blast. Lori Reed, Andrew Pauly, Malcolm Ross, Peter Bellwood, Terry Crowley, John Lynch, upon uh, uh, many more, among others. But as early as academic year 1923-1924, Otto John Schirr uh, was already teaching courses in the department like Linguistics 101, History and Methodology of the Comparative Study of Languages, and Linguistics 102. History of the Exploration of the Oceanic Languages. So, despite the shifting foci and research priorities of our department over the past 100 years, there has always been an interest in the history and connections of the languages of the Philippines with the rest of the Austronesian language family, or AN. So, wag kayo malilito po kapag sinabi ko palaging AN. Ang ibig ko sabihin doon ay Austronesian language family para mas maikli. Come first semester 2017, I was given the assignment to teach Ling 150 for the very first time. It was during that semester that I realized how dynamic and rapid the changes were in the field of an linguistics. It was in the same year that Laurie Reed or Lawrence Reed delivered a lecture at La Salle where he recapitulated all prior work done on the genetic unity of Philippine languages and rehabilitated reaffirmed his stance that there was no single proto-Philippine language, the purported ancestor of all indigenous Philippine languages, 
a position he first declared in the 1982 paper, The Demise of Proto-Philippines. In the following academic years, 2019, 2021, and 2022, I was able to further fine-tune my syllabus, adding not just journal articles, but also podcast episodes, video clips, online posters, and journalistic pieces discussing discoveries from different fields like linguistic historiography, archaeology, anthropology, and even genetics. So before I go to my purpose and plan, I wish to show an artifact joke lang. Uh, <laughs> Doodle galing sa klase namin ni Sir Tuting. Then rowing ko dito si, siyempre kilala niyo siguro Sir, si Zolai. <laughs> Mahabang bubalbas at saka may salamin. So pwede nating, uh, I can make one or I can even leave it for a time. Yeah. Doodle lang po talaga siya. <laughs> Kasi pinag-uusapan namin si Zolheim. At dinescribe ni Sir Tuting kung anong itsura ni Bill Zolheim. So, gumawa ako ng munting uh, guhit sa aking yellow pad. So, para sa mga estudyante dito, yellow pad is the way. <laughs> okay. So, purpose and plan. What do I want to achieve this noon? My purpose for this talk is to take stock of some of the pertinent questions in ang ling uh, and linguistics. Some of the issues I will bring up today might already be addressed by recent archaeological and genetic findings. The other questions admittedly lie outside the purview of historical linguistics. After all, we must affirm the point that linguists deal with human languages, not genes, not bones, not teeth, not artifacts. Past the 10,000-year mark, linguistic evidence is unreliable, if it is even available. So my first question, or my first theme, why out of Taiwan? Why do we believe, or do we... Uh, subscribe to the out of Taiwan narrative. The main reason why an linguists have agreed on the general narrative that the language family originated in Taiwan, formerly known as Formosa, is because the indigenous Formosan languages, one, retain the most sounds and sound distinctions from the reconstructed ancestor Proto Austronesian or Pan, and two, exhibit the highest level of diversity relative to the other parts of the language family. Put differently, if the indigenous Formosan languages have uh, retained the most phonemes and phonological distinctions in Pan, and all the primary sub-branches of An remained in Taiwan, then that must be the homeland. The highest point of diversity, mukhang dun yung homeland natin. It is a uh, linguistic diversity, to clarify. It is from this linguistic conclusion that we try to find parallels, supporting evidence, and clues from other disciplines and fields. So ito yung lagi kong pinapakita sa klase na mapa kung saan kumalat ang mga wikang Austronesiano or yung Austronesian language family. Two mainstays of the Ling 150 syllabus are the archaeologists Peter Bellwood, which I already mentioned a while ago, and Bill Zolheim. At first glance, the surf or surface level reading, they seem to present two competing narratives. It, Zolheim, in his 1985 paper, The Nusantao Hypothesis, The Origin and Spread of Austronesian Speakers, identified Mindanao or Northeastern Indonesia as the center of development for Pan, a maritime lingua franca formed out of barter and contact. He first proposed the term Nusantao from the indigenous Austronesian roots Nusa and Tao to replace the cumbersome phrase speakers of Austronesian languages. Ang haba eh. Tapos kapag paulit-ulit nating sinasabi, mahirap, di ba? So, uh, uh, mag-exceed tayo sa word count. So, Nusa and Tao na lang daw. Although, it's not as simple as that, I, as I will uh, later on discuss in the next paragraphs. Bellwood back the... Uh, oh, sorry. And to acknowledge the inherently archipelagic and sea-bound nature of the communities who left behind the artifacts uh, he studied, Z Zolheim studied. On the other hand, Bellwood backed the out-of-Taiwan narrative of an linguistics from the area of archaeology. In his view, standing on the shoulders of Richard Shuttler and Jeffrey Mark, an speaking peoples came from Taiwan and moved south into the Philippines, into the rest of island Southeast Asia, or ICEA. Madagascar and the Pacific. 
they brought with them food production, some form of dentates, stamped pottery, tattooing, and even headhunting. I have since learned that Zolheim made some recalibrations to his theory, stating that the Nusantao were a maritime, and I quote, a maritime-oriented trading people, probably speaking an Austronesian language. Thus, the Nusantao Maritime Trading and Communication Network, or NMTC, he clarified, was not in one-to-one -one correspondence with the expanse of the speakers of the An languages. And as Servic has rightfully pointed out in his introduction to the book, NMTC is more than just a reaction to the Out of Taiwan narrative. In this, and this uh, comprehensive synthesis of the archaeological and cultural record of mainland and island Southeast Asia, southern Taiwan, and uh, southern China, and Taiwan. Another layer to the question why out of Taiwan is, why did the speakers of Malayo-Polynesian, all the An languages found outside of Taiwan, migrate in the first place? Bakit nila kailangan umalis ng homeland? Bakit nila kailangan umalis ng isla na yun na Formosa? Bellwood points to the population instability due to an emerging food-producing economy. A relatively small island like Taiwan will only have a limited carrying capacity for a rapidly, rapidly growing population who have learned to cultivate various cereals. Zolheim's work has emphasized the aspect of barter and material culture exchange in shaping the region. Thus, he invoked as evidence shell tools and wind currents between the different island networks of ICEA to trace the movements of peoples. Question number two, what came before the An speakers? So, ayan, kumalat na po yung ating mga wikang Austronesiano. At yung pinagpuntahan nila, halimbawa yung Philippine archipelago, hindi yan uninhabited nung dumating sila. There were already um, humans or populations residing in the islands that would be called the Philippines and the rest of Southeast Asia. Different collective identifications are given for these pre-Austronesian populations quote-unquote Negrito, which is Spanish-derived and frowned upon actually by some of these communities. Quote-unquote, once again, Black Filipinos, a term used by linguist Jason Lobel in his dissertation, which uh, in my opinion has not gained much traction both in academia and in the indigenous communities themselves. And quote-unquote, basal Australasians used by geneticists. In my view and in my own teaching and research practice, it is best to take a particularist approach to naming conventions and just use the respective community names for themselves or for their languages. For example, Kabuluan or Aita Maganchi, Aita Magindi, uh, Inagta Alabat, Katubong, etc., etc. The received wisdom in Ling 150 is that these pre Austronesian populations were predominantly foragers or hunter gatherers. Their social and economic structure was fundamentally different to that of the sea-bound, Austronesian-speaking agriculturalists. However, in a 2019 paper by Marian Klammer, she referred to a 2005 study by Sue O'Connor and Peter Veth, citing early Holocene shell fish hooks as evidence for pre-Austronesian complex fishing technology in ICEA. Further, Klammer concludes that Original pre-Austronesian populations could also have been archaeo- ah, sorry, <laughs> agriculturalists, or populations mixing vegiculture and arboriculture, if there is little archaeological data in the area to clearly support the hypothesis of a tuber economy prior to the serial one that might be due to the difficulty in obtaining such evidence from the context. Are there findings from archaeological sites in the Philippines and in other sites of island Southeast Asia that will shed more light on this topic? Question number three and my final question that I wish to bring up in this talk, how did later language groups get to where they are? In 2017, Alex Smith, who had just then received his PhD from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, published a paper titled The Western Malayo-Polynesian Problem. He addressed the discrepancy between how an is traditionally represented using a binary branching family tree, as shown here. Let's enlarge this one. Binary branching 
because you assume that from an ancestor, Malayo Polynesian, you have bifurcating nodes of the tree. Western Malayo Polynesian as opposed to Central Eastern Malayo Polynesian. Central Malayo Polynesian versus Eastern. So binary, para nag fork naghahati sila. Where was I? Okay, the large left branch of the family tree, this one, Western Malayo Polynesian, did not stand up to scrutiny as a distinct subgroup of Austronesian. And instead, it must be broken up into at least nine pri primary nodes of Malayo Polynesian. This alternative rake like representation of language groupings would have been the result of a rapid movement of Han speaking peoples through ICEA leaving behind communities that would develop their own distinct languages in different island networks. So this, this time, this is the alternative model. So rake-like yung ating structure. Instead of assuming that there is a single Western Malayo Polynesian node, Alex Smith, along with Adelard Donahue, Grimes, Ross, argue that there should be multiple complex representations and branches of the Western Malayo Polynesian node. The previous binary branching model presupposes a long settlement of Western Malayo Polynesian speech communities in a single concentrated region. It is in that region that they cooked all of the linguistic innovations that would set them apart from the other parts of Austronesian like the Oceanic languages. Evidence, archaeological or linguistic, for the single locus of long-term development for WMP has not stood up to close scrutiny. Zooming into the Philippines, there has also been much later evidence of migrations and back-migrations of the language communities left by the Malayo-Polynesian quote-unquote express train. So, for now, while linguists can rest easy on the status of Taiwan as the homeland of the Austronesian language family, Language family, I should stress. The monolithic north to south direction of Han speakers might be considered a convenient idealization. Kasi, nakikita natin dito sa family tree, it seems to give us a sense that all they did was migrate from north to south and that they were going in only one direction. But if we look at the particular evidence in the Philippines and in other regions of island Southeast Asia, there was a lot of back migration from south going back north. There were other um, intermingling and interactions of the different language groups. So I'd like to highlight two case studies here. Cristina Gallegos' master's thesis on proto-botanic acknowledges the seemingly competing signals from archaeology and genetics on the question of the role of botanists in this Austronesian history. Bellwood and Dizon's artifacts from Torongan Cave in Itbayat point to a longer settlement history compared to mainland Luzon. On the other hand, the findings of Lu et al. point to the possibility of, and I quote, a recolonization of Batanes from the south based on the high genetic affinity between the Ivatans and the populations of mainland Luzon. On the side of linguistics, the Batanic languages descended from Proto-Batanic, which was reconstructed by Mam Cristina, share more structural affinities with the languages of northern and central Luzon, tipping the balance, at least for now, in favor of a northward recolonization from Luzon. So, napunta na yung mga Malayo-Polynesian speakers sa mainland Luzon, tapos merong bumalik, umakit ulit, at yun yung naging proto-botanic. At least, lumalabas dun sa thesis ni Ma'am Tina. Next, Robert Blust has also proposed a language leveling event in the spread of his hypothesized Greater Central Philippines Group, or GCP, which encompasses the majority of ind indigenous Philippine languages in the Central and Southern Philippines, and even some groups in Indonesia, such as the Gorontalo Mongondo languages in Sulawesi. In this scenario, and I quote, around 500 BC, for reasons unknown, speakers of Greater Central Philippines began to expand outward from a center somewhere in northern Mindanao, or the southern Visayas. Through conquest and absorption of weaker populations, they reduced the linguistic diversity of the Visayas, Palawan, and southern Luzon. Could archaeology help us understand and uncover Blust's reasons unknown? 
to conclude, while uh, what I have shared this afternoon are some scattered reflections and questions left hanging from my uh, short tenure of handling the Classling 150. Some of the questions, as I said a while ago, totally lie outside the province of linguistics. And that is why I propose to have this Binalo talk, thanks to Mark Garcia, <laughs> because of the, uh, the idea that was floated in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. <laughs> Magkaroon tayo ng binalo talk na pag-usapan natin yung mga bagay na yan. <laughs> To foster dialogue and interaction between our fields. Our respective discoveries may yield discordant narratives, chronologies, and timelines that are a mess to reconcile. But that scientific inquiry, right? To make sense of the messy realities that confront us. Maraming salamat. Um, sa historical linguistics, kahit na it would be favorable to have the written record, such as in Latin. Sa totoo lang, um, this is purely subjective, pero parang mas naging madali yung trabaho ng mga nag-reconstruct ng Latin at saka ng Proto-Romans kasi meron silang access sa written records. Tayo dito sa Austronesian language family, we don't have any written records too work with. What we have are the present-day languages. And the hallmark of the historical linguistic method is the comparative method, which is trying to reconstruct prior stages and ancestors of the languages based on the present-day forms in the daughters. So that's what I mean by evidence from linguistics. I see. Okay. I see, sir. Uh, yes, Sir Mandy. Uh, uh, first question is good. First question. I have a serious letter. Uh, you I guess the Department of Linguistics does not really uh, uh, take uh, Arsenio Manuel's Filipination seriously. Is that correct? Are you familiar with, with, with Manuel's Filipination? Uh, uh, Arsenio Manuel. Yes. So, wherein he hypothesized, diba? Ang sabi niya the proto austronesian is a monosyllabic language. When it become uh, uh, Austronesian, become uh, by uh, by syllabic no so yung idea ng ng suklay ay galing sa suk suk lay lay then combine so suk is actually ang suk suk no ang original word ng suk suk ay suk so that's a monosyllabic version which became duplicated and become by by syllabic uh, so marami siyang mga ganung classic examples but but uh, in, in your discourse you never really discuss as as Saint Manuel sa paradigm no yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up, sir. At saka sa conversations nga natin na uh, papalabas yung mga hypotheses ni uh, E.R. Senyo Manuel. Sa, sa karanasan ko bilang undergrad, mas na papag-usapan namin siya sa konteksto ng folklore, yeah. dun sa mga sulatin niya sa folklore. Yung tungkol sa pagiging monosyllabic ng earlier uh, stages of the development of the language family, Unfortunately, dahil, um, dahil sa structure ng academic um, institutions natin or sa access sa knowledge, sino yung nagpo-produce ng knowledge, mas naging sikat yata sa Austronesian linguistics world yung hypothesis ni Robert Blast tungkol sa Austronesian monosyllabic roots that can be compared with E. Arsenio Manuel's um, hypothesis. So, hindi ko alam, sir, kung pwede pa nating tingnan, sir, kung nag, uh, nagbasahan ba sila, or... Uh, uh, Manuel, I think, refers to Blast. Ah, okay. Oh, um, Manuel's last student before he uh, stopped teaching. Mm. This is after the war. <laughs> <laughs> after my, after my, my class with him, he to work. So technically, sir, na alam ni Manuel yung mga... No, he was referring to Blas, but he was trying to incorporate nga yung idea niya ng Pilipinasian. Opo. It's a thin monograph that he used to sell to us. I guess you mean the third word for the English. We might have a published one. Yeah, self-published. I think we have a copy. Uh, uh, Hanapin ko yun, sir. Yung second ko, uh, at least in archaeological context, no? Uh, so Solheim, although I'm a Bolivian student, no, maybe partially right. 
but the, ang mali sa kanya when he calls it Austonesian. I don't think so no san tao is Austonesian. I think I believe that no san tao is a pre-Austonesian. Because be, be prior to Solheim's so work, no, ang problema natin with archaeological record is meron tayong uh, blackout area or uh, kung lang ang date natin from 10,000 to 5,000. Pero ngayon, we now, uh, with, with our good archaeological work, we're finding out that actually, malaki yung uh, discovery ng, ng time na yan kung saan meron ka ng tao talaga dito, meron ka ng trade. Pre-Austonesian. So meron ka maritime trade, gumagalaw siya, mga shell culture, coastal environment, na definitely hindi siya Austonesian. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. So whether it's Negrito or not, we don't know. Yeah. But definitely, meron ka ng what, what uh, uh, Saul High would call lusang tao. Kaya niniwala ko sabi before the Bellwood that uh, it's in the Philippines where uh, the outrigger was invented. No? I, I would believe if, if that outrigger was, was uh, invented, it may still be somewhere in the, min, in the central Philippines. No? Mindoro to the Visayas. No? Kasi hindi pwede sa Norte. Eh. Hindi pwede galing sa Son. Kasi mamamatay ka kung may outrigger ka doon, patay ka doon, di ba? So out, the outrigger should be here. Pero, since meron ka ng maritime culture in this region, Palawa, Mindoro, Visayas, no? baka, baka, baka nung namatay yung Austronesian, meron ng outrigger. No? But, but of course, we need to uh, find more evidence. Yep. Anyway, ilang yung saan. Salamat, sir. Thank you, Sir Mandy. So now, we're opening the floor to more questions. Uh, yes, sir. Ayun, hello, Vinci. Okay, so... Yung tanong ko, eh, sorry kung medyo malawak. So parang may nakikita ko na may recent archaeological and genetic findings, especially tungkol sa Kraday and Austronesian. Hindi ko sure kung familiar kayo, pero ano, parang sinabi nila na yung Kraday parang nag-back migration from Taiwan and then parang may archaeological evidence sa southern China na pumunta sila from southern China to yung Southeast Asia and then parang ginamit rin yung ano yung linguistic findings and then ito rin yung binanggit ng isang ano researcher galing University of Victoria sa September Linguistics Conference so ano yung mga thoughts niyo regarding yung parang yung paggamit ng archaeology at saka yung genetics at yung linguistika yung Parang sinabi rin ni Robitz, pero hindi siya Austronesian researcher, mas Northern Asian languages siya, na yung Holy Trinity of Disciplines para sa ano, paghanap ng proto-languages or proto-peoples. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, I remember Alex Smith tweeting when I was still on Twitter that he was, um, that he was, <laughs> ex na pala, sir. Ayun, iniwan ko na, sir. Eh. Ayoko na dun, eh. Um, I remember him saying that he is interested in working on the linguistic connections. So, dito muna tayo sa ling. Uh, on the linguistic connections of Proto-Austronesian or the Austronesian language data and Kradai data. Kasi meron ding mga past studies that point to a prior connection, earlier perhaps than uh, Taiwan or Southern China, that could connect the two language families or language groups. So definitely, the, the field is promising, at least on the linguistic realm. Not sure about findings from the other uh, disciplines, and that's why I agreed to have this binaluto. Kung ano yung magiging picture of mainland Southeast Asia, if we're going to relate it to insular or ICEA, island Southeast Asia. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Benji. <laughs> Chum. Yung mga chum sa yes. central, chum. central Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Pwede yung mag- magtanong, hindi ko lang kung covered to sa historical linguistic, pero kasi may mga terms uh, sa Austronesian language na nag-iiba ang meaning. Yeah. So, for example, yung ayam, mm. <laughs> sa mga ilonggo, aso po yun. Pero ak- in many parts of Southeast Asia, pag titingin namin yung Malaysian, Indonesian, yes. manok pala siya. Kaya nakakatakot, di ba, pag tumingin namin, kasi hindi ka kumakain ng aso, tapos nakikita mo sa menu, ayam go rin, ayam yeah. go rin. So, so paano nangyari yung, yung, yung word na ayam? 
Sobrang baba. Hindi ko alam kung saan. Sagot ito lang historical linguistics. Um, actually, sagot siya ng historical linguistics. At ang sagot namin ay hindi namin alam. <laughs> uh, in more... In more uh, roundabout, in a more roundabout way, ang tawag ng isang linguist dyan, si R. David Zork, ay uh, divergent semantic loads. Ganun. Diba? Just another way of saying you don't know. Hindi ko alam eh. <laughs> chicken, biglang naging aso. Diba? So, mm. so, sa mga ganung cases, uh, oh, thank you for bringing this up. Kasi sa mga ganung pagkakataon, Iniiwasan na naming pilitin na magkaroon pa ng connection yung mga meaning na yun. We just need to acknowledge that they diverged somehow. That some groups decided to use I am for this creature. Some groups decided to use I am for this other animal or creature. Ganon. Well, there are... Mm, there are uh, gen general uh, tendencies, but they remain tendencies. Na may mga, lagi may exceptions dun sa magbabago yung kahulugan ng salitang ito into this word. Ganon. Si, hmm. Yung parang sa Germanic languages, yung word na deer sa English is yung deer, yung specific na animal na yan. Pero sa German, yung tia, yun Yun yung parang ano, any animal in general or animals in general. So, or and, and all animals in general, sa German. So parang sa historical linguistics, sinabi rin nila na parang may semantic narrowing. So from a certain type of animal, magiging one kind of animal lang. <laughs> Hound or dog, or yung example, yung fowl in English refers to a certain kind of bird. Pero sa German, yung vogel, yun yung parang all birds in general. Ayan. <laughs> Sorry, it's again, thank you. Vince, perfect binalo to. I say this, it's perfect because you came with an idea that you, uh, you uh, thought about, you chewed on independently from, a di uh, from your discipline, linguistics, historical linguistics. You were engaging with Mark, who's also someone who's in archaeology, interested in wider uh, questions. And then you uh, floated very important questions, which at the moment, like you said, hindi ka pa tumataya. Maganda yan kasi the discourse has been going on since this close hand-in-glove discourse between linguistics, archaeology, later on with genetics, since the 80s. Mm -hmm. We were a bit naive in the early days. We thought hand-in-glove. Mm -hmm. Then realized, aye, the scales are different. Mm -hmm. uh, and that led to some tendencies of uh, circular arguments. Yeah. Now we're beyond that. One thing that you demonstrated uh, is linguistically, uh, the discipline is very dynamic. So dynamic that you, you gave us two clusters of authors, the, the more traditional and accepted historical linguist, Blas, uh, 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 Andy pa Pauli, no? um, what's the name again? The one who works in the north. Um, uh, Lawrence Reed. La Laurie Reed, Laurie. right? And then you gave us the next set, like the Donahue, no, Tal Talard, no? and in fact, Peter Bellwood doesn't engages them heavily, engages them heavily. Now, the, the thing here is, uh, for me personally, the out of Taiwan has no problem, but it answers only a very specific question. Wh where, generally when, right, and, one dire uh, and what direction, did Austronesian languages spread into islands Southeast Asia and the Pacific? After that, even Peter Bellwood will be open to suggestions and engage. But some, one thing good about Peter, you have to convince him with data and information. It's not, it, can, it cannot be just speculation. And that's, and that's why we 
keep on researching. So there's so much room for historical linguistics to contribute. <coughs> for example, detailing. For the longest time, we've been wanting you guys to give us more details of sequences. Ano ba, sino ba ang mas matanda? Ilocano ba? Or uh, Kapampangan? Diba, ganyan. Sa pagaling ang Bisaya, sabi ni Ricky Inolasco, bohol. But kahit i-torture mo, hindi naman niya sasabihin kung bakit. No? So in other words, uh, so mapapakamot ka lang ng ulo. In other words, kulang ng, kulang ng research pa. No? And I'm, I'm so happy that you are interested and there others are interested because then that means that there are more chances of basic research in a comparative historical linguistic uh, manner. We need that. The archaeology is working. We're slow, we're slow, but our data is accumulating. For instance, if you suggested 15 years ago that there were more complex societies, more uh, larger, perhaps, communities beyond uh, Negritos in island Southeast Asia, you will be, uh, no one will listen to you. Now th there's more arguments for uh, the existence of so many other cultures in island Southeast Asia mm -hmm. uh, prior to 4,000 years ago. So that's the shell industry, what they call yeah. in general, mm -hmm. huh? uh, represented. So there's, there's good work going there. Genetics, they're way ahead of us. So much so that they actually have other questions already. They left us behind. Now they're interested in other questions. Huh? And so if we want to get them interested, we have to be more, well, challenging to them no? and, 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 and engage them to answer those old questions that we're interested. The, I am exactly what you presented. I, I, I am convinced that there are so much, and that's why, if anything I like about the Solheim hypothesis, it is the idea that as soon as human beings saw this landscape, as he said, they were maritime oriented. But like Mandy said, we need evidence. We need evidence. We're creeping into that with friends uh, doing actualistic studies on, um, uh, on seafaring. No? Like um, Mandy was our friend, Kaifu. Kai our, our friend Kaifu, who does a lot of that. No? So, dumadami yung, yung evidence natin. No? So there's so much promise here, really. But I do have a question for you, and tell me anong sagot mo, no? Okay, sir. <laughs> My problem with the origin of Austronesians in Taiwan, it seems to be grabbing and believing, believing with a capital B, yeah. an old biological premise, where you have more diversity, mm. that is where you have your origin, correct? No? Yes, sir. Mm. Adapted to linguistics. Yeah. But as you know, maybe we have a problem with that already, right? Because some will say, maybe we are not looking at the origins, you're looking at a refugia, mm. where this is like, just because they were isolated a bit, and therefore they, they create, they, they form into this many diverse Austronesian languages. Then of course, one supporting argument for that, if you have seven Austronesian languages, seven or 11 in Taiwan, and you're More telling than, me that mm. one left, and that one language that left really has no traces of, to all the other Austronesian languages that were left in Taiwan. No? That makes you wonder. But what's your opinion about that? Um, sinabi niyo, sir, dun sa question niyo na we all know that uh, there are already problems with the assumption that the point of a highest diversity is the most likely dispersal center or the origin. The problem with me is that I don't know about that because I, all, I, all along, I was, uh, I was assuming that all of us were in agreement that, ah, so ito yung dispersal center kasi ito yung highest level of diversity. So parang uh, medyo pinasa ko yung bola sa ibang mga disiplina sa pagkakataon na yun. Sabi, ka, sabi kasi nila sa biology, sabi nila sa archaeology, more or less ganun yun eh. So kung kaya nating ma-conclude yun, baka pwede nating makita din yung pattern na yun sa mga wika. Uh, ang maganda dyan, 
the so-called Western Malayo Polynesian, which some will, will label as the, uh, like Ricky again, or last we like it. No, just call it Philippine languages, right? And and Ricky and Alaska will argue strongly. No, no, this is already different. You know, it, it's not Western Malay Polynesian. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that thing that okay, people like Dan and your company are arguing. No, 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 something else is happening. That's why it's a rake. You know? mm -hmm. So there's so many interaction, uh, back uh, movement, later day movement. If you ask me, the real impact of Austronesian today, why we are we have so many so commonly Austronesian languages. As a time depth of about 2,000 years. So everything that happened 4,000 years ago, I will argue, maybe we will hardly see traces of that. Mm -hmm. The real horizon of impact of commonality of languages in the region will be a shallower horizon without, without saying that the 4,000 horizon did not happen. Yeah. Uh, but again, that's a hypothesis. No? Uh, but uh, like I said, basic research, historical linguistics, you carry on in a linguistic department, don't follow the older folks that they left the department and became advocates. No? <laughs> Mentor, do basic research, right? Comparative, you know, give us a wonderful plan of uh, the sequence of Philippine languages. And that, I tell you, that would be such a contribution to all of us. Hey, Sir Vic. Okay, Sir Mike has a question. Hello. Um, so Vince, may tanong yeah. ulit ako um, relating to chickens. Okay. So um, so for, um, so in in the Formosan languages, so basically, kung tama yung basa ko from a decade ago. So in Formosan languages, chicken and birds will only have one word referring to them. Yes. Yes. Tapos uh, uh, pagdating na sa WMP where uh, we develop our own word for chickens, distinguishing it from birds. Yeah. Ano yung, ano, ano, what's your opinion about that in terms of animal-human interaction? Okay, uh, two things. First of all, um, it's not quite clear-cut the, the way the words for chicken and bird develop. Kasi sa sarili kong uh, basic research nga, uh, I, was, I was involved in a documentation project of Inagta Alabat. In, um, in Quezon Province. So these are um, whatever you want to call them, Basal Australasians, quote-unquote Negrito, um, pre-Austronesian descended populations. Yung word nila for bird is just manok-manok. Manok-manok. And then manok is manok. <laughs> so kapag nireduplicate mo siya, uh, magiging, yeah, magiging bird siya. Yes, uh, in some languages, ma'am. Uh, parang mas maliit na manok. So the first um, part of your question, yung the distribution of the words is not always. Formosan is totally different from Western Malaya Polynesian. On human relations, I'm not ready to uh, commit to... <laughs> An opinion on that. Because <laughs> uh, oh. yun yung, yun yung oh. na baka maybe we have a linguistic evidence for yeah. a local domestication event here in Ireland, Southeast Asia. So I'm not sure. Mm. Okay, I'm asking you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank Pero you. Ano, um, maganda kasing tingnan din yung punto na dahil dito sa grupong ito na pinagtaalabat, which are the purported, pur 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 ilang ulit yun na, purported to be the, the descend, descendants of the original populations of the Philippines, uh, there might be some different patterns happening in their languages versus the languages of the later Austronesian-speaking migrants that entered our archipelago. Yeah. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Yes, Taj. Hi, <laughs> Evinci. Um, I know that you have a paper with EJ, no? but it's yes. to be published or sa social Opo. science. Mm -hmm. I know it's already there. Someone informed me. <laughs> okay. Um, but so, in connection, yung Sugbu, kasi interested ako doon dahil, oh, uh, Sugbu is apparently, um, supposedly or apparently the name of, the old name of Cebu 
And then, di ba si Zeus Salazar, marami siyang mga um, hypothesis of these populations going north. Tapos interested ako dun sa Nasugbu. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Um, so, and the connection dun ay, um, are you looking at migrations using these words or using obviously linguistic data? And then yung second question ko ay, pinag-usapan namin ni Taj kanina yung Nasi. Kasi mm. sa Kapampangan, ang rice ay Nasi. So, would, yes. do you have an explanation why the mm. word, the old term for it uh, is not used anymore. Ah, okay. And then, of course, yung interactions with Indonesian populations because of this word. Yes. Well, the most economical, I'll start from the last question. The most economical explanation for Nasi being present in Kapampangan and Bahasa Indonesia is that Central Luzon or Kapampangan-related languages could have preserved or could have retained the term. Uh, a more original, uh, a more an original ancestral term. And then the languages in Greater Central Philippines, South, uh, Central and Southern Philippines, they innovated or they just decided to use another term for rice. Uh, yes? Abyas, yeah. Yeah. Abyas. Ay, may nauna si Taj, tas si Aldrich. Ayun, nasugbo pa. Oo nga. Well, di, di, wala pa akong kayang itayang explanation dyan, ma'am. Eh. Pero dun sa Central and Southern Philippines talaga, at least in terms of, at least in terms of linguistics, parang back and forth, north to south, east to west, ang migrations ng mga tao. Eh. One thing, uh, one particular subgroup of Philippine languages that I'm, that I'm very invested in is the Visayan languages. And a particular branch of Visayan might have been the result of a westward migration from Samar. Yun yung mga central Visayan languages like Iligaynon, Porohanon, um, uh, Akianon is west talaga. OG sila dun. <laughs> west talaga yun. Pero yun, uh, yung mga speakers daw ng hiligay nun ay maaring nang galing sa mas silang. Okay, so... Mamaya pag-usapan ko. Yeah. Oh. And a part of those Central Philippines yun, yung Tagalog. <laughs> West, yes. Yes. full northward. But anyway, yeah, kasi um, one well, the reason kaya humatin ako dito kasi because the third question, which is yung what are the archaeological perspectives on the other, um, the, la the later languages na nag-sprung up, like yung the backward, the... Uh, Okay. Anyway, um, like for example, the greater Central Philippine languages, yung kay Blas, di ba? So, and the Central Philippine languages in particular, no? kasi they have the same emigration point, if I could say it better. Kasi si Zor, kasi they, he used the word emigration point and not actually origin, original yeah. area. No? So, area kung saan nag, they all migrated or all moved towards where they are right now. No? Yes. The, now, um, one of the problems that we have, and I, I will also pose this as a challenge then for for others, other student archaeologists dito na, um, what I think kasi uh, are the historical linguistics and the archaeology, yung pag, um, pag merge or pag tutulungan nung, um, nung studies na yun, kind of stopped until dun sa period lang ng Austronesian expansion. We have actually have no idea what how can um kung ano yung input ng archaeology when it comes to other languages or in the philippines afterwards no so for example yung yung um movements ng greater central philippine languages yeah. uh blas already mentioned it around 500 bc di ba yes. hypothetically and we also have to remember there in archaeology there, something also happened around 500 bc more or less no see solheim have mentioned this that there's a 
um, in around 500 BC at least merong this sahuin kalanay uh, language na tradition starting to expand and we also have this uh, um, novaliches type of pottery um, kind of already going on in the in the northern uh, in in Luz, southern Luzon and in Palawan area or northern Palawan area at the least ano? so why can't we just try to use that as a starting point in investigating if there are any correlations with the movements happening around that period in the languages and at the same time movi- uh, movement around the area in in the Philippines a whole archipelago around that period then no? and with that baka we might find something no? so for example like what we're seeing here in the, in the languages na, no, like greater central Philippine languages there's actually certain problems uh, kung saan yung kanyang movements kasi nahirapan tayong maghanap ng makaharap na any archaeological evidence meanwhile at around 2000 uh, years ago at least we know that some of the shell artifacts because I'm studying shell artifacts um, there was a huge um, distribution ng mga shell artifacts na um, may mga earlier evidence sa Palawan that started moving uh, eastwards no so would that um, give us an idea about um, or, or would that uh, give us insights about what would be the possible movements of the communities carrying those languages as well in the mm. around the archipelago so at least somehow in a, um, I think we should try also to look at that those later periods and try to ask questions if um, what can this te- uh, tell us about you know spreading of languages as well or movements of languages in the Philippines so in lang. Thank you, Dutch. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Dutch, for the mini lecture. Um, sorry, last question. Na lang po si Kuya sa likod. <laughs> Usap na natin. Usap na. Oh. Question lang din po pagdating ano po related din po sa movement. Na parang may way po ba tayo para ma differentiate kung ano yung mas short term dun sa long term. Na parang mm. kasi po di ba ako nare sa linguistics po yung time depth na issue, di ba? Parang mas may kita natin yung change sa language kapag mas matagal. Pero kapag ano, may certain migration patterns na parang pwedeng mas short term yung dating. So, paano natin may kita yung difference sa ganun compared sa uh, yung ano lang, may kita natin kung short term ba siya or kung long term or parang may conflate ba natin yung movements na yun or not? Parang ganun. Okay. Uh, good question. And I think this is a uh this is a good chance to wrap up the Q&A. Pero gusto ko pa kayo makausap later. Um, yung sinasabi ni Aldrick, I think is, student ko nga pala si Aldrick, um, I think gets at uh, the troubled history of one methodology in linguistics, which is lexicostatistics. Nadebunk na kasing lexicostatistics. And uh, it has sort of left a bad taste in the mouths of practitioners of the disciplines. Because there is a there is an assumption that languages lose vocabulary at a steady rate. Na every 100 years or every 1,000 years, mga ilang words yung mawawala sa wika mo. Hindi steady yun eh. <laughs> daming mga noise and daming mga factors na kailangan pag uh, isaalang-alang doon. Kaya tayo kumakatok sa mga pinto ng ibang mga disiplina. Para makita yung mga pwedeng pagkakatugma, marami ding mga hindi pagkakatugma. At makabuo ng kahit pa paano nag-overlap ng mga naratibo. <laughs> Although, uh, last na pala, last na pala. Parang may, may umuusbong ulit ngayon na phylogenetics sa uh, linguistics. Pero hindi, mas, hindi magkasing haba yung tradisyon ng paggamit sa kanya kaysa dun sa classic comparative method. Short question. Is there anyone researching on uh, remains of languages that were uh, taken over by the Austronesian? In other words, the language ship, let's say, mm. uh, Laurie Reed found one or Opo. two. Uh, Asli, uh, Bob Blas found one or mm. two. Is there anyone following that up, that kind of research? I can, off the top of my head, I can think of two. Yung una ay si Dayan Manzano who wrote a grammatical um, description of Inete which is a Philippine language isolate spoken in Panay. Sa Panay po. Sa Panay. Inat, inati or Inete. Yeah. Where is she based? UP Los Baños. 
Yes. Si Diane at sa kami isa pa na kaka-proposal defense lang si Lance Castro. You know yes. Lance, right? Lance Castro who is going to um, who is going to describe Aita Magindi in I think Pampanga. If, if there's more research, we'll yeah. be able to extract more yes. of these uh, old uh, remnants of the old land. Mm -hmm. My studies regarding parang substrate, kasi yung mga mm -hmm. um, Aita populations na yun, yung languages po nila is yung Austrian. Pero may konting substrates pa rin yung may hinahanap na ano, parang word na hindi pala Austrian. Parang from a certain time. So, parang kung makukumpile ng mga words na yun. Thank you, ah. <laughs> Thank you sa pag-moderate. Pag-usapan based on yung substrate sa mga Austronesia and Haida languages. Pag-usapan pa natin, Dave. Mamaya, pag-usapan natin. Linguistics na ba? Linguistics. Grad student po. Grad student namin. Oh, ipaklose na natin. Ipaklose na natin. <laughs> okay. Okay, guys. <laughs> Let's wrap up a little bit. So, thank you again, Mr. Vinci, for your wonderful talk. Wonderful talk. Sure, thank you. Maybe you'd like to consider a master's in archaeology ah. where you specialize in historical linguistics, no? All right. So, thank you, everyone, for the Banala Talk. Next week, we have Dante Manipon. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop. Okay, bye-bye. Let us please vacate.